thank you for joining me for this talk entitled, The Science of Obesity, Where Might This Lead Clinical Practice? I'm Dr. Sean Wharton, adjunct professor at McMaster University and York University, and the medical director of the Wharton Medical Clinic in Toronto, Canada. Obesity is a pandemic. It affects between 650 million to 1 billion people across the globe and 9 million Canadians. Excess adiposity causes or exacerbates multiple medical conditions, including diabetes, cancer, and COVID-19. We know that the inflammation caused by the white adipose tissue causes these conditions. When there is an inability to properly store excess calories in healthy subcutaneous fat depots, the energy ends up in visceral adipose tissue that becomes dysfunctional. These cells can become hypoxic, leading to the tissue dysfunction. And this dysfunction leads to inflammation made up of adipokines causing destruction. So how good are we at treating obesity? Unfortunately, we have not been very effective for a long time, and only recently are we getting a bit better. This Canadian study for my clinic looked at over 7,000 patients over seven and a half years, all doing lifestyle management, a healthy diet, and some, and, and some activity. We wanted to know weight loss and patterns of weight loss. We plugged the data into a fancy program and came out with these seven patterns. Let's focus in, in, in the center. The purple and yellow representing weight stability or minimal amounts of weight loss of 2.3%. This made up two thirds of, of the patients. A small group of patients did do well at 21% weight loss, but most patients cannot achieve significant weight loss with just lifestyle interventions. But do we need greater weight loss? Sure we do. Let's look at the improvements we get in medical conditions with weight loss. We get some diabetes prevention at 3%, but more at 10%. Many conditions need up to 15% weight loss, such as diabetes remission. So more weight loss is better. Well, this talk is about the science of obesity, and we can't get to sustained weight loss until we understand the actual science. Well, unfortunately, Obesity science is in its, in, in its infancy, and that's not good. Why? Because obesity isn't new. We have known about the connection between obesity and disease for a long time. Why is it so understudied? The answer is likely due to obesity bias. People don't think that it is worthy of study. It's not a disease. It's a social problem. Get on with it. Eat less and exercise more. So we have to deal with that first. When we get past the obesity bias, we're now faced with the fact that obesity pathogenesis is really complex and involves biological, genetic, psychosocial, and environmental factors. Body weight is meticulously, reg is meticulously regulated by, by the brain, an organ we barely um, understand at the best of times. So what causes this increased weight in the first place? When we look at the science of energy homeostasis, we see that even a small surplus of caloric intake, less than 1% over energy expenditure, can result in accumulation of excess weight and over a few years lead to elevated BMIs. Much of this is driven by genetic factors coding for eating behaviors. What about these genes? 25 to 50% of the risk for obesity is actually inheritable. Greater than 140 genetic regions are now known to, um, to influence obesity traits. Genetics um, are also now starting to uncover the genome of, of thinness. So these genes code for areas within the brain. The three areas of the brain most involved are the mesolimbic or the hedonic section, the hypothalamus or the homeostatic center, and the frontal lobe or the executive functioning center. These regions of the brain are primarily designed to protect against weight loss. The intensity of this protection is driven by the genetic coding. As we gain a greater understanding of the workings of the brain, and as it relates to elevated weight, we can develop treatments that really work within these specific areas. So what influences the, the brain? Lots of things like sight, smell, emotions, and 
the gut. We have a gut brain circuit. Hormones like GLP-1 and PYY delay gastric emptying and are potent anorexigens secreted by the L cells in the small, in the small bowels in response to food ingestion. These are the good hormones and people living with obesity either don't have enough of them or they are not making it to the receptors within the, the brain. Leptin and insulin are also part of the good hormones and bind to their respective receptors in the arcuate nucleus of the brain to decrease food intake and increase energy expenditure. Unfortunately, people living with obesity, they either have leptin resistance and they have insulin storing energy in fat cells well before the message of stop eating gets to the brain. The gut microbiome is important and an emerging scientific advancement, but there are no treatments ready at, at, at this time within the gut microbiome realm. So what does this science lead us to conclude about obesity? This slide is likely the most important slide in, in my slide deck. The science tells us that obesity is not caused by overeating, but that overeating is caused by obesity. This is not just a play on words. It has been shown in many studies that overeating cannot cause obesity if you do not have the neurochemical and genetic profile to develop obesity. This is nicely shown in the famous overeating studies by Rudy Leibel. On the other hand, if you have genetic and biochemical um, systems that are set up for obesity, this leads to hunger, cravings, and overeating, leading to elevated weight. Digging deeper into the science, some time ago, my mentor, Dr. Arya Sharma, wrote a review on the etiological framework of obesity. Weight is controlled by the in and the out of, of calories. And the in is dietary, it's the food, and the out is the metabolism and the activity. Let's explore the science of metabolism. All of these factors listed here can affect metabolism. Most of this we cannot control as it is defined by genes. But let's look at some of, some of these factors. We have a small amount of control over our muscle mass, although most of it is determined from a genetic standpoint. One pound of muscle burns six calories and one pound of fat burns two, two calories. Stated a bit differently, if you eat six calories, this can be used to maintain three fat cells or it can be burned up repairing a muscle cell. Resistance activity can clearly have an impact in maintaining muscle mass during weight loss. Another factor in metabolism is age. As we grow older, our mitochondria dies a bit each year and we lose our metabolic rate, make it harder to maintain weight as we age. This mitochondria is predominant within muscle tissue. The biggest challenge to metabolism is weight loss. As you lose weight, your metabolism drops 3% for every 10 pounds, and that is a significant amount. In this study by Kevin Hall, a Canadian working at the NIH, he looked at the metabolic rates and compared patients having massive weight loss. He compared bariatric surgery patients to the biggest loser competitors. The biggest loser is a, is a is a, a TV program. It's designed to have competitors lose weight with exercise and, and also diet. But essentially, this diet is oftentimes close to a starvation diet. Participants in, in both groups lost a significant amount of weight, on average, about 50 kilos, which is almost 110 10 pounds. So who lost fat versus losing muscle? So the biggest loser candidates lost more fat than they did muscle. Only 16.4% muscle lost. That is good news for them. They were exercising and doing muscle training. The bariatric surgery patients lost fat and muscle, but lost more muscle than the biggest loser patients did. They lost almost 30% of their muscle mass. It's almost twice as much as the biggest losers. Um, so we know that more muscle can mean a higher metabolic rate. So now let's measure their resting metabolic rate at the end of the study when they've lost this, this, 
this weight. We would expect that the biggest loser competitors to have a higher metabolic rate, right? Well, wrong. The biggest loser competitors had a lower metabolic rate. Why? They have more muscle mass. It turns out that starvation diets drop your resting metabolic rate in a severe manner and, and overcompensate, overcompensates for, the, for the, the retained muscle mass. Starvation likely modulates hormones such as leptin, leading to more efficiency and a lower resting metabolic rate. Here we can see that leptin dropped more in the Biggest Loser comparators, Comparator cohort than in bariatric surgery, maybe due to the starvation type, of, type of, of diet, so especially at the end of the competition. Here is where we get into the science of metabolic adaptation. This means a lower than, expect, lower than expected, expected metabolic rate. An example, if someone loses 100 pounds, they go from 300 pounds to, to 200 pounds, their metabolic rate would be lower than a person at, at 200 pounds who has never lost any weight. Even worse, if they regain weight back up to 300 pounds, their metabolic rate may never recover and stay very low. What we know about the biggest loser competitors is that almost all of the participants regain all of their weight and some of them more than their baseline weight within a short period of, of, um, um, of time, within one to, to six years. Here we see Sean, Sean Allerger. Before the competition, he weighed 444 pounds. After the competition, he weighed 289 pounds. Over a few years, he regained all of this weight back up to 450 pounds. And fortunately, his metabolic rate is 500 calories below what it actually should be, making it very hard for him to ever lose weight, weight again, at least, at least in, in a reasonable fashion. The previous study was was um, the previous study was done soon after the end of the end of the Biggest Loser, the one that I previously showed. Now fast forward six years. Remember, everyone regains their their weight. Here is the weight at baseline, um, and at the end of of the competition, uh, the end, end of the competition, and then six years afterwards. You can see that there's a significant regain here. Now here is the sad part. Let's look at the measured or actual metabolic rate versus the predicted or the expected metabolic rate. At baseline, measured metabolic rate was close to the, to the predicted rate. At the end of the competition, measured was almost 300 calories lower than what it should be at that, at that lower, lower weight. That is metabolic adaptation. And then here's the real kicker. Six years later, after they'd regained the, 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 the weight, the measured metabolic rate is lower than it was when they were 40 kilos lighter, more than 500 calories below the predicted weight. That is severe metabolic adaptation. So their metabolic rate never recovers. So which hormones and metabolites end up predicting this? Bottom line is we're not really clear. We have some ideas. Here, Kevin Hall looked at a number of hormones and metabolites. T3 actually goes up, so that is not it. Leptin falls in a dramatic fashion with, with fat loss, as was already shown, but it does not recover with the elevated weight and with the fat regain. This is likely a, a major factor, but we've not figured out how to replace leptin or why it stays so low. There may also be other hormones that end up contributing to this metabolic, meta, this metabolic adaptation. All of the science and metabolism is new and it, and it is evolving. We may see interventions in the area of uncoupling proteins to try and pre prevent this metabolic, metabolic adaptation. We're no longer looking to increase the, the metabolic rate and we did that with previous drugs that didn't work well. We're now looking to just to keep 
the metabolic rate from dropping so severely when weight loss happens. That is the newest area of obesity research. So what do we currently have as targets for obesity management? We have the brain, the brain which the hormones and, and the neuropeptides. We have the gut with hormones that are connecting to the brain. We have the peripheral tissue, the muscle tissue, and the brown fat with metabolic rate. And we have the genes we could potentially modulate there. Currently, the area that has the most immediate promise and some success is in the modulation of hormones and neurochemicals within the brain and, and also gut. Our current understanding of the brain-gut hormone has helped us to design treatments that actually work, psychological intervention, pharmacotherapy, and also surgery. Based on this science, there are now options for pharmacotherapy. We have some medications approved here in, um, 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 in, in Canada, and there are some emerging medications. Liraglutide was the first effective weight management medication to come to Canada in 2015. Liraglutide concentrated with concentrates within the hypothalamus and the arcuate nucleus. Weight loss was quite good in, in the completers, going down to 9.2 per cent, an intention to treat with that last observation carried forward of 8%. We don't use intention to treat or last observation carried forward any longer. We use estimates, and they would have come in handy here as the dropout rates were quite high between 30 to 40 per cent, and that's where estimates really shine. Bottom line, for the first time, patients got some relief from their obesity with a daily injection. The primary side effects were nausea, impacting up to 40% of patients. This was both tolerable and also it was transient. We did a real-world study with liraglutide and found that we also got good results of eight kilos or 7% decrease in weight. We also saw nausea as a side effect, but we also noted that constipation was a challenge for many patients. The second effective drug to hit Canada was a combination drug, naltrexone and bupropion. Both drugs working within the brain, likely the hypothalamus and also the mesolimbic system. Weight loss achieved at one year was fairly good. It gets up to about 8% in, in the completers and 5.4% with an intention to treat uh, analysis. Again here, the dropout rates were nearly 50%. So last observation carried forward was clearly the wrong parameter to actually use. Again, estimates would, would, um, um, estimates would have helped here. But overall, we're seeing about an 8% weight loss here. There was improvements in cravings, and this is a real problem for many patients. The main side effect was, again, nausea. This medication cannot be used in patients with a seizure history or those on opioids. So far, the two medications that we have here in Canada have not pushed past that 10% weight loss mark. Enter semaglutide, a once-weekly GLP-1 analog. This trial published three weeks ago in the New England Journal of Medicine in patients with overweight and obesity without diabetes using a higher dose of semaglutide compared to the approved diabetes dose of 1.0 one of 1.0 milligrams. Here, we finally cracked the 10% average weight loss range, getting up to almost 15% weight loss with semaglutide 2.4 milligrams. Estimans are actually used here. And the good news is, is that there was limited dropouts and loss and limited lost to follow up. This is the most impressive aspect and the reason why many people are calling this a game changer. One third of patients got close to surgical weight loss of greater than 20%. We have never seen that in a non-surgical trial, especially with a medication that can be taken once every, every week. The main side effect was, um, uh, was, was again nausea dissipating over time. Another emerging medication is, is actually amylin. Again, targeting the brain, decreasing appetite, and increasing the feeling of fullness. 
The monotherapy phase two trial shows 10.8% weight loss, but the compelling studies are looking at the combination of amylin with a GLP-1 analog. And this phase one trial showed a promising 17% weight loss. These are early days, but this certainly is promising. Nausea and GI upset were again the main side effects. The newest emerging medication is a molecule terzepatide, a dual agonist of GIP and, also, and, and GLP-1, treating both diabetes and also weight. Most clinical trials with terzepatide are in patients with diabetes. The study is represented in blue. But weight management trials in patients with and without diabetes, seen here in purple, are also pending. So what can we expect from terzepatide? In patients with diabetes, this phase two trial showed 11% weight loss. We know that patients with diabetes lose less weight than those without diabetes, likely due to metabolic adaptation. So therefore, we can expect even greater weight loss with this molecule in patients without diabetes. The main side effect of terzepatide was again nausea and GI side effects. So in conclusion, obesity is prevalent. Inflammation causes multiple complications and it is understudied likely due to bias. The science of obesity is complex and driven by brain neurochemistry. Diet and exercise alone are not sufficient for obesity treatment. Effective treatments for obesity are limited, but they are increasing rapidly. The gut hormones and peptides are the primary targets for pharmacotherapy agents. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope this presentation was helpful.